And this is the moment when I officially welcome you to um, session number eight from our art slash practice based research seminar series. And this is session number eight on reflective practice. So I'm really, really, really happy and, and um, delighted really to have Dr. Robert Marsden with us today. Um, I'm going to share my screen once again to officially uh, introduce Rob and tell you a little bit more about his amazing practice. So Dr. Robert Marsden has been a freelance theatre director since 1998 and he holds a PhD in acting and directing. He is the author of Inside Your Rehearsal Room, and this is uh, the book uh, which we have a privilege to um, have a sneaky peek into, because uh, Rob was kind enough to sh share one of the chapters from the book, so we're going to hear more about it um, throughout this uh, seminar, throughout this session. Um, Rob is probably our head of department here at Staffordshire University, so head of Department of Media Performance and Communication. Um, but he is also an Equity and Stage Directors UK member, a senior fellow of HEA, and he undertook his teacher training at Rose Brafford. As well as his BA, MA and PhD training and studies, Robert has also taken short courses in voice with the late Christian Linklater, directing for screen with Patrick Tucker and Michael Check of Technique. Intimacy training for directors and Shakespeare's Chekhov with Max Huffer, um, Chekhov training and performance in Ireland. Rob has worked extensively in commercial and sub society theatre across the UK and Europe, including directing for Imagine Theatre since 2007, Celador Worldwide since 2016, New Vic Theatre in Newcastle under Lyme between 2000 and 2006, Bolton Octagon, Stephen Joseph Theatre in Scarborough. Theatre Productions, National Tours, Victoria Theatre in Halifax, Aberswife Arts Centre, Milton Keynes Theatre and Sadak Playhouse. Repertory seasons include work with Leatherhead Theatre and Swanesh Mollam Theatre. He was creative director of the Reveal Theatre Company LTD from 1999 to 2015 and he dipped his toe into radio and television for the BBC. And between 2018 and 2021, he was joint artistic director of the Mitchell Arts Centre here in Stockholm Trent. Um, so I'm going to stop trying quick. And the next hour is yours, Rob. Thank, thank you very much, Agatha. I'm just going to now share my screen. <laughs> um, give me a second, and I'll bring up a PowerPoint just to help step through a little bit. Um, and Agatha, will you say if um, uh, that it all comes up for me. Would that be okay? Yes, we can see it already. That's fantastic. Great. Um, oh, oh, that's not the one. Yeah. It's definitely. Is it there now? It's there now. Yes, wonderful. Great. <laughs> Let me go to slideshow, and then. Um, great. Yeah. There we go. I think I'm. I think I'm in a slideshow. Is that right? Or am I seeing on my notes? Or I think we see the presenter mode. So we see your next slideshow. So you might want to. So I can swap those content. Yes. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Well, th um, thank you for inviting me um, uh, very much. I'm, I'm, I'm Rob Marsden and uh, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, uh, I'd like to say that, that this is a really personal approach on reflection for the next, say, 50 minutes or so before we go into more of a, more of a Q and A. Um, it really helps to try and my reflection is on bridging my professional life as a theatre uh, director and hopefully a reflective practitioner without being an academic uh, in an institution. So this is very much a personal approach on, on my reflection on my personal practice, but how I reflect in my practice um, and how that has led to um, my PhD study and how that fed into my eventual book and back into my practice again. So hopefully through the next 50 minutes, I'll, uh, it's, it's quite a blurred and chaotic relationship, but hopefully uh, you'll see how it all aligns. Um, I'm not going to talk in real depth around some reflective models. I will introduce some of those, but I think the majority of the people in, in this room um, will, will know some of these models, be using some of those these models in their practice. But I will just introduce a few very quickly at the beginning, the ones that I found quite useful that have informed my stages uh, of reflection. Um, 
But if I may, I'd really like to begin with a little reflective exercise just for two minutes with everybody here. And we don't have to share back if we don't want to, and that, that's fine. Um, but I'd like us to begin with a little reflective exercise. I'd really like you to think about a time in your own practice. Now, this could be as an educator. Many of us are educators in the room or as a practitioner or as a creative practitioner. Um, I'd like you to think about a time in your own practice when at the time maybe of doing something, you didn't fully get the why. I don't quite get why I'm doing this. Uh, and that that understanding occurred afterwards. That might be five minutes after, afterwards, or it might be several years after doing something. So my question is, what, what led people to that aha moment, that light bulb moment, where, we, where that understanding did come into play? and did come to the fore. Can we pinpoint that aha moment? So I'm asking everybody to reflect on a moment where they didn't understand why they were doing something. There was certainly something in my undergraduate curriculum 25 years ago, I didn't understand why I was doing it. And then much later I understood why. Um, so I'm just asking everybody for two minutes to think about a potential moment in their careers, either as an educator or in their professional lives. Um, and then the understanding came later and see if we can pinpoint that aha moment. Um, Sort of very quiet. I think we should have music now, Agatha, playing music in the background as people think. I think you, you should have told me before. I'll prefer some report for next week. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, such a great question. I have to say that this whole seminar, the very first session, started with me reflecting how certain things which didn't really match at some point connected at some point in my professional career. So I don't want to hijack it over here, but it's really interesting how sometimes you just need a perspective of time to, to understand. So I'm really looking forward to where this conversation needs up. So just another 30 seconds or so on this. I feel like I'm leading a seminar in, in that way, in a room again. Um, <laughs> And if you care to share, that's fine. I invite people to share. I don't force people to share. If anyone wanted to share, please put your hand up or pop drop a few things in the chat. That's fine. Um, I think we have one answer. Uh, great. Jocelyn, would you like to unmute yourself or would you prefer us to read what you said there? Um, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I um yeah, I'm a um a lecturer in publishing at Derby, but and been in the publishing industry for since my first job in '97. But didn't actually start theorising and understanding the why of my editorial practice until I began my PhD, and then after PhD, teaching my craft to students because we get so busy in industry, we forget the why, which is do. Um, and so I think it's fantastic to integrate reflective practice, both as an educators, but as practitioners within industry. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I remember my uh, the first time I was um, an associate director at the New Vic Theatre here in Staffordshire, and then I was asked to come and teach directing on the undergraduate course as a guest. And I thought, oh, I just do it. It's embodied. My knowledge is embodied. I, I haven't actually articulated my practice since about 15, 17 years ago. And I thought, gosh, I've really got to unpack that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Francisco, I think, is type, typing something in. We'll have one, maybe one more and then, um, mm -hmm. uh, and then and then we'll move on. I think it's quick. Uh, I think it's yeah. quick if I can. Hi. <laughs> hello, hello. Hello. Yeah, and just reflecting is not something precise, but I think about as a practitioner uh, working sound and sound art for quite over, I don't know, 10 years maybe. And now a PhD student, I think at this stage I'm doing research, I start to connect dots and points and crossing disciplines. 
And this idea of the touch technology, the way of doing things and making things that's kind of embodied in my experience of making things now start to make some connections in terms of um, what kind of knowledge you can produce, what kind of uh, patterns, correlations. Uh, but I don't have a clear answer for that. I'm still, I'm still in the same process trying to find uh, um, how things make more sense through my practice in research. And making more sense, isn't it? I think that's really interesting. When you look at a lot of the literature around practices research, it, it identifies and says we must acknowledge the chaotic nature of a lot of our practice. And that actually we're trying to make some sense of it. We're trying to capture some water in our hands at times, aren't we? So yeah, that we must embrace that chaotic nature. And that's a good starting point. So yeah, thank you for sharing. Wonderful, thank you. Nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. So yeah, so um so just to continue, I was reflecting on a job that I did at a drama school in 2010. And it was this moment where I left the rehearsal room and I decided that I couldn't articulate my practice very well in front of a group of students due to the embodiment. And it was reflecting on this moment that made me think that I needed to, um, uh, I needed to draw out some of my implicit knowledge and make it really explicit. So it was, it was later that I realised that some of the kind of the um, performance studies work that I'd done and some of the conceptual work that I'd done at university only really made sense when I was working very much in a drama school environment. I could draw on something far later uh, from far earlier in my career uh, to, to make sense of uh, the students practice in front of me but that was through reflecting on my prior knowledge reflecting on what had happened in that rehearsal room that day with that group of third year acting students in a drama school and wanting to improve on my practice which i'll come on to in a minute um, and the two there's a few models that i that i use um, and they probably will not be uh, in any way. Uh, well, that was the slide I had there when we were, we were supposed to be reflecting. There we go. <laughs> um, uh, some of you are probably aware of John Driscoll's model here, um, which is quite simple, really, um, which is which there are three stages to it in, in many sense. So what what happened? The description of the event. So if I'm just looking, looking here on the right hand side, just the description of the event. And then so what? <laughs> the analysis of the event. And then most importantly for Driscoll, the now what? What am I going to do following the event? So in that case, what? I realised that I wasn't able to support the students in the way that I really wanted to support the students. The so what? The importance of that. Was, so I was trying to analyse that event. Why couldn't we articulate that practice? The now what? was around that what I needed to do as an educator to, to support uh, students articulate embodied knowledge. So I didn't realise at the time, but I was using the, 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 the Driscoll model here that started in 1994 and it's gone through lots of different iterations. Um, and, and this uh, and this diagram is from a paper in, in 2007. Um, we're probably very much aware of this learning cycle, this reflective cycle here, starting at the, um, we can start anywhere, but I'll start at the top here. Uh, it's a flywheel, but we'll start at the top. There's a concrete experience, I've had an experience. We then go through some kind of reflective observation. So I reflect on what, uh, on what worked, what didn't work, and so on and so forth. What happened in that moment? The bottom there, there's this notion of abstract conceptualization. If I was to be in that situation again, what would I do? So we're trying, we're conceptualizing a different outcome. And then finally, that notion of active experimentation, the one on, on here again. I'm going to put that now into practice. I've taken my theoretical conceptualization that's at the bottom there of the circle. I then put that into practice back in the rehearsal room, in my case as a theatre director. I put that back out into practice and it keeps moving around. That goes back into a concrete experience. So this cycle here, uh, that again was beginning in 1984, it's gone through lots of different iterations, this whole notion of this reflective cycle, this reflective model here. So uh, uh, what's important here, there's some kind of transformation in the middle of that flywheel, that notion of the transformation. So we're trying to grasp something, trying to make sense of something conceptually, but then there, where there's a transformative moment, but through that reflective cycle. And when um, Agatha, you asked me to to 
uh, to do this seminar is really thinking what does reflection mean to me? What does it relate to? And I could boil it down potentially to, th to three things. One is professional practice, that reflection allows me to improve and refine my professional practice. In my case, as either theatre director or as an educator. So the next time I was able to get into a room um, with a group of acting students after that moment uh, where, where uh, of realization, I was able to improve my um, uh, my uh, myself as an educator for those groups of students. And as a theatre director, if I'm reflecting on my practice and reflecting on other people's practice, which I'm going to come on to in a minute, reflecting on other people's practice, then that helps inform my own practice. I know whose shoulders I'm standing upon. I know how my work is is um, uh, where it sits. Secondly, as we spoke about earlier, that whole notion of drawing out the implicit knowledge, that potentially that embodied tacit knowledge and making it explicit, that really helps for me as an educator, So, uh, which we've spoken about earlier. We, uh, in the theatre, where I'm, my background, we somatically encode information. We somatically through encode information, so sometimes this needs drawing out. And also, what's really key for me is that we're not leaving intuition to chance. You know that moment that we all have, oh yeah, that's it, and then we move on. Actually, we have a that's it moment, an aha moment, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, in, in a bit. But we, we somehow need to capture that moment. We need to look at that moment of transformation and realisation and, and move and learn from that and move on, put it into the next iteration of that cycle that we were looking at earlier. So the aha moment for me is vital in my practice as a reflective practitioner. And why, um, when I said, oh, send a chapter of your book, and I thought, well, which, the, the chapter that I sent events, and, and don't worry if you haven't ha had a chance to look at it, but it really exemplifies, I think, how, how I've reflected on my own practice, other people's practice, uh, in a way, so I'm thinking around the whole notion of um, some observation that I did in a rehearsal room, which I'll come on to in a bit, and then how my research has underpinned my practice and informed my practice. So, I've spent quite a bit of time really thinking around um, when I was looking back on that chapter, I realised that the exercises have been informed by reflecting on 20 years of being in a theatre rehearsal room. Um, some of the conceptual frameworks that are in that chapter have been about reflecting on my practice and other people's practice. So trying to make that reflection meaningful and it feeding into uh, the next iteration of my practice. I'll probably read that chapter in five years time and change things again, but that's fine. It should always be, it should always move forward. And I think we use reflection all the time. And I certainly encourage um, my students to use this. Uh, uh, I, I flash this next slide up to my students quite a bit, which I really like. It's John Britton. He's an acting practitioner. Uh, he writes in his book on encountering ensemble. It's, it's nearly 10 years old now, but I think it's still relevant. Uh, Britton talks about experiencing first, then recalling, then reflecting and then finally seeking to understand. Experience something first, then recall, then reflect, then finally seek to understand. And I don't know about my colleagues here who might be educators as well. Often when students have come straight from school, sixth form or college, they'll try and seek to understand first and miss out all the steps before and a lot of the first year experience, the level four experience is about trying to get a genuinely, uh, genuinely trying to get them to sit in the experience before the reflection, before the seeking to understand. And John Britton talks about kind of some uh, quite a lot, but two takeaways from John Britton are around do before you reflect, reflect before you decide, which I really like, do before you reflect, reflect before you decide and reflect on what you are doing, not how you are doing. So take the judgment away from reflection on your own practice in the studio. Reflect on what you are doing, not how you are doing. You're not trying to compare yourself through your reflection to anyone else in the rehearsal room or the studio or the workshop if you're a student. And he talks quite a lot around not speaking during exercises, just encountering practical exercises, practical work, and then and then the analysis, the interpretation of that moment follows a, a deep reflection on the what. 
And this really relates to, to Donald Sean's notion of, of reflection on action. And many of us in the room are probably really um, aware of that, the reflection in action, in the moment. I adapt my behaviour because I'm reflecting in the moment. Even if there's a slight pause, I'm still reflecting in the moment. Or I reflect on my action. So I might be the next day or the next week or the next month thinking back on something and then I'll do something different as I reflect back on the action in that way. But for me personally as a practitioner, for me absolutely personally, um, reflecting on action relates to me around breakthrough moments in practice and aha moments. So moments of discovery. And I, and I talk about these as kind of stepping stones through the creative process. And when we have a breakthrough and an aha moment in our creative process, we need to have that. We need to stop on one of those stones across that river that's there. And we need to unpack that moment and reflect on that moment before we move on to the next. That reflection may be only may be implicit or explicit, but there's a moment where we take stock and move forward. And I think this is particularly important when we're supporting students in work. It's particularly important when we're supporting practices, research students in their work as well, because a lot of things become absolutely embodied as we as we move through our practice. But actually early doors, if we're working with students, and I know I'm talking to a lot um, lots of different people here, lots of different backgrounds and and job titles. But if we're working with students, then how do we how do we stop off at these various points? Allow them to reflect before they move on, so that their practice is contextualised in that way, in a really meaningful way that improves their practice. Um, because sometimes you don't realise there's been an aha moment. Someone else needs to maybe maybe draw on that and say, you had a moment of discovery there. Can we have a moment? Can we just stop for a minute and reflect on that? Or we might, uh, yeah, we might stop ourselves. But sometimes if you're in a practice based setting, uh, again, in theatre, my background is the director or the, or the acting teacher will say, can we just stop for that moment? I saw you had a real turning point moment there. What was happening for you in that moment? Let's reflect on that. So. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, a breakthrough is an advancement in knowledge, an achievement, a development or a discovery that removes an obstacle to process. So it's an advancement in knowledge, an achievement, um, a development or discovery that removes an obstacle to, sorry, to, to process. So that whole that, that moment. And in my field, theatre practitioners always differ around defining the aha moment, this breakthrough moment. And I think this is really important for me personally in my personal journey as a reflect practitioner, this aha moment uh, and, hence, and it's captured uh, in the book. Um, so, for example, we know uh, Stephanie French and, and Philip Bennett talk around a, an inspiration as a starting point, a moment of great clarity when something that has been challenging is deeply understood. So we've had a challenge moment and then we break through and we move forward. We need to reflect on that moment, what's happened, why have we broken through? We'll be using a certain exercise, a certain technique to get through and so on. But we also have different practitioners. Dominic Drumgall, who used to run the Globe Theatre, talks about um, we'll never have a moment of aha, that moment of absolute epiphany. Um, for example, he talks about that in relation to Hamlet, trying to direct Hamlet. We should never get to that moment where, ah, we know everything about the play. So people use this word in different ways. I think aha moments sometimes can seem quite enormous. Some breakthroughs can be smaller. And I agree, we will probably never know what uh, Hamlet's all about, really. Um, so we shouldn't try and, and push ourselves to that point. So I just want to pause uh, to step off for a little bit around the aha moments. And we've been looking, science has been looking at these breakthrough moments since about 1961, why these aha moments come about. Um, uh, that had been studied before that, but it really gathered a pace in the 1960s. Um, John Beeman and, uh, sorry, Mark Beeman and John Kuhnis state that aha moments are not sudden moments of insight, but come about through inquiry, that gentle inquiry that leads to an aha moment. It's all packaged in that moment, in that way. So uh, in 1961, uh, William Gordon, uh, Bill Gordon in some of the literature, introduced to the field an aha moment of bringing together of previously unconnected moments, joining together irrelevant elements. So he was trying to reject the notion that we have a discovery moment or a breakthrough moment, uh, particularly in creative practice, um, 
uh, that these happen mysteriously. Actually, he says we can reflect on these moments and we can unpack those moments of breakthrough um, because we can do it because we there are always things that feed into that moment. A question, a moment of reflection, a moment of discovery. You've read something else or someone's triggered something uh, to you. And finally, Gordon talks about in order to break through that you need to state the problem before you can solve the problem. You need to recognize often the problem before you then solve it. And it happens in rehearsals all the time. We say, gosh, we're stuck here in the mo I'm stuck here. I don't know what happens next. And then we have a moment and the director and the actor will often reflect together on that moment. Let's go back to the text. What's happening for you in that moment? Let's talk that through what's happening internally. So doing a lot of reflection before trying to move forward, but by, but by articulating it, it enables that moment of pause, we stop, we reflect before we move on. I'll skip a little bit, I think. So in 2018, I undertook, and I'm going to talk about ethnography in, in a moment and alter ethnography, but I undertook an ethnographic observation. So I sat in rehearsals for five weeks and watched other actors and directors at work. Um, Sheffield Crucible and Outward Joint here in the United Kingdom uh, produced a new play, a new writing company by Kate Bowen called Close Quarters. And it fed into my book, it fed into my PhD, it fed into my book, it fed into then uh, my reflective practice. Um, and actors did state their problems really openly in the rehearsal room. So they reflected on a run through, spoke through where their sticking points were, reflected on those moments before moving forward. So as researchers, I always say that we're aiming to recognise through our own reflection and judgment, our own moments, as well as other people's moments through our observation. Through rehearsals, actors and directors are always building on their existing knowledge of theatre making, where they've trained, what they did in the, in the rehearsal room <laughs> the previous day or the previous week, any earlier research into the play, and a new insight is often seen through the application of existing knowledge. Edward Bowden in 2005 said that our harmony occur when, quote, solvers engage distinct neural and cognitive processes that allow them to see connections that previously eluded them. So something's happening, there's been like a sheen of something, and now that becomes really clear and we can see it and we move forward through this reflective process. And interestingly, um, uh, Lee Longhurst, she's a, a, a life coach, and she talks about this moment of pause before a breakthrough. She'll often see with her clients a moment of pause, and then they'll go, oh yeah. So there's a moment there, reflection before actually uh, moving forward. She calls it the, 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 that, that kind of impasse before moving forward, before following uh, a mood. And she'll often ask questions that will be, tr will, which will trigger upon reflection. And often she'll say that she'll have a session with her clients a week later, and they've had an epiphany moment at home, at home, not in her session. They reflected on something, either implicitly or explicitly, consciously, subconsciously, they've had that moment of reflection and then they brought an answer back to the next session. And this is really interesting for me in theatre practice. Terence Crawford is an Australian uh, uh, theatre practitioner and he talks about the sub-rehearsal, which is, which is basically any moment where you're rehearsing or thinking about the rehearsal process that isn't in that 10 o'clock till two o'clock bound time of working with your director. So for example, you might be at home, you might be in the shower and go, ah, yes, that's what that scene might be about. You might be chatting to someone in the coffee shop. He says all those moments are part of rehearsal, but they come through moments of incubation that then tr through reflection will often trigger breaking through a moment and having a moment of discovery and allowing then that to be brought back into the rehearsal room and then the practice moves forward. So in terms of being a reflective practitioner, it's acknowledging that those moments can happen at any time, both in, in the rehearsal room or outside of the rehearsal room, in filmmaking, on set, in the trailer, those moments of sub-rehearsal that might, might take place. And a moment of insight, we had to share an example here of an aha moment um, in, in the rehearsal room here. These are from my field notes, and I'll come on to the methodologies in, in a bit in the second part of the presentation, where I'll unpack some of this reflective practice. But here's the field notes. 
um, and I'll read it out. So Dylan Wood, the actor, asked, asks where to put the emphasis on the line, do you think I'd tell? Kate Wasserberg, the director, doesn't give a line reading, but gives context. You've really liked, secretly like, really liked her for a year. You'd never ever betray her trust, but this is so special. This has a knock on effect. Wood starts playing around with the emphasis and then plays on each word of the line and suddenly hits the emphasis on the word tell. Suddenly Wood shouts, yes, he jumps into the air. Beth Ann Dawson, Deputy Stage Manager, Wasserberg and Jesse Haddon Shaw, the Assistant Director, simultaneously cry out using words such as, yeah, yes, Wood beaming and grinning. I heard it, I heard it, I heard it. A great moment of discovery, a great moment of breakthrough. Uh, and I reflected on that moment quite heavily in my own practice as an observer to say, actually, there was a moment where there was a struggle in rehearsal. He was really struggling and they stopped. They articulated the problem. They reflected on the problem. They spent time looking at the text. They spent time in the conversation. This um, quote here just captures a little moment of that. But there was a moment of impasse. There was a moment, of, but they recognised this. They reflected on the issue in the moment, in the rehearsal, and then were able to move forward as practitioners. But they were able to articulate explicitly what the problem was. He did not know how to say the line and why the line was written in that way. I'm just going to talk around how I captured uh, some of this. Now, don't forget, this is not my practice. I'm observing other people's practice and I'm reflecting on their practice after the event. But Robin Nelson discusses the importance of documenting any uh, any process in practices research or observational research. So Robin Nelson talks about the importance of documenting the practice. I wasn't creating the work here, as you know, but you can apply this methodology to your own practice also, moving from the, this notion of being just the practitioner to being the practitioner researcher. And I just want to show you what I was kind of up to in that room um, on the next slide here. So uh, and I'll, we'll send all these slides out, I think, and it's, it's recorded anyway. But um, I was making loads of notes in rehearsals, what I was observing. This was page 78 of, of, of a couple of hundred of pages. I had the time down, down the left hand side. The recording note, I was um, doing a dictaphone recording of sections of rehearsals. I was aligning it to the script page. My really messy notes that will only make sense to me down there. You can see yes, and I've circled it um, about half, uh, three quarters of the way down near the bottom. That was this moment when he said yes. That really struck for me that I needed to transcribe that moment because it was so important to me. I needed to transcribe that moment for my dictaphone. I had all the ethical approvals for this and, and so on and so forth. I transcribed that moment and wrote it up and reflected on that. So that moment right there at the bottom identified that moment of the breakthrough. Um, I, I, I captured some moments. I put a little star there in, in my script page annotation there. And I knew because of the section here in the recording note, I needed to transcribe that moment of that rehearsal so I could reflect on it later. Could reflect on it later. And Kate Ross Maneth, she's a rehearsal practitioner, does a lot of practice as research, a lot of reflective practice. Um, but she talks about this notion of field jottings to field notes, that when you're in the field, you're jotting stuff down. You're either doing that yourself as a practitioner, reflecting in, the, uh, you know, after the moment, or I'm doing this as an observer on other people's practice. You can really use your field jottings. They're messy, they're scrawly. Coding comes from a certain um, a grounded theory methodology. We may or may not have time to talk about that today, but I was trying to code along the way what types of breakthroughs were potentially happening. But it's, you can see my notes are really messy. And every evening I would go home and reflect on on that practice of that rehearsal room and I would type them up. Here we are into into field notes. So I would uh, I would be doing quite a lot of work here every evening, taking some key moments of that rehearsal and typing it all up. So I was reflecting on the moment. I was trying to make sense of that moment um, for myself as a researcher in that moment, drawing on the conversations in the room, 
also drawing on the nonverbal communication. So the idea of the beaming and grinning from the actor was really important because a lot of the research in terms of breakthroughs in practice show that there's a positive, positive energy that comes from somebody when there's a moment of breakthrough. So that beaming and grinning thing there uh, is, is relates to um, uh, that moment where I thought that was the moment where the actor had had a breakthrough. Now, I thought that they'd had a breakthrough, and, and I'll talk in a bit around this notion that I had to check that. That's my assumption as a researcher looking at other people's practice, reflecting on that day. So that's really important. So this methodology can be used in autoethnography. So you're observing your own practice or going back on your practice. You might be videoing your own practice, you might be recording your own practice, or ethnography where you're observing somebody else's practice and learning from that. Um, this all started, by the way, by a practitioner called Gay McCauley um, in the 1970s. She wanted her students in the theatre department, I think it was at the University of Sydney, I'll double check in a minute, um, she wanted her students to learn more about their own practice by observing other people's practice. And she started to create a way of working where her students would watch other students at work and have to do exercises like this um, in order to try and understand what was happening for other people in their practice for those moments. So this, so this whole notion of rehearsal studies came out of wanting to support students to really build on their own practice. from Kate Ross Mammoth um, and I built on her methodology for, for this. She talks here around I divide my notes into field jottings and field notes. Jottings involve the scrawled notes I take on the fly while watching rehearsals, always with the time written next to them with bits of dialogue, mini sketches. She uses sketches to capture practice. I tried to sketch it was a disaster, didn't use sketches. Um, she sketched around space, blocking, half-formed questions and thoughts. You are painstakingly gathering piles of details and thoughts before building the analysis. The jottings are bored and rough. The notes start to get a sense. It's the John Britton sense of I experience something. I then do, I then analyze through that reflection and then finally I seek to understand. So through that process, Kate, Kate Rosmanith asks us to really think about experiencing something, whether we're doing it or watching it, then making sense of this chaotic, um, rough process, and then finally seeking to understand. It's a messy approach, but that's fine. We're talking earlier about that notion of chaos and, and chaotic. I was obviously checking, cross-checking discussions and transcribing keynotes from the audio recordings. So the close quarters example there really opened up and identified that there was a real fluency and confidence that the actor had following this breakthrough. And I asked him afterwards if it was a breakthrough. I asked them all to reflect on moments of their practice. And I asked them, this is what I thought a breakthrough was. Did you think this was a breakthrough? This was about three weeks after the rehearsal process finished. And he said, yes, that moment was clear in my mind as a breakthrough moment when he reflected on his practice. Because there are a number of people who talk about practices research who said that we've got to, we, we, if we're taking something quite subjective, I think this is what's happening. How do I verify that? How do I make sense of that as a researcher? Moving us from practitioner to practitioner researcher. And I think there's a couple of myths that we have to um, uh, bust a little bit here. One of them here is around um, magic and work, particularly in creative practice. Um, Kevin Ashton, who writes, who wrote a book called How to Fly a Horse, debunked in 2015, debunks the myth that creativity is an elusive activity that only a select few uh, geniuses can, can attain. As he says, uh, quote, creating is not magic, but work, not magic, but work. He's paraphrasing Brecht there, Berthold Brecht uh, statement there. When David Selborne in uh, 1979, 1980 was observing rehearsals of Peter Brook's seminal production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, which changed how a lot of uh, scenography and design was done in the United Kingdom, um, uh, one actor in that moment talked around, and it's here, um, she said, I don't, 
she was questioned around a moment in rehearsal. She didn't want to reflect on that moment. And she said, I don't admit it to anyone when I know something magical has happened, it would destroy it. This myth here that if I if I strike to unpack my practice through reflection, it will somehow disappear. My ability to act will suddenly disappear if I stop talk if I start talking about it. And that's a myth I think we we as a community of practices researchers um, need to uh, need to, to uh, bust. We're not this holy grail nation of creativity, of discovery, this earth shattering moment. Um, we mustn't articulate it because it might disappear. My magic, my powers, my creative powers might disappear. I understand that concern as a theatre director, but as we were talking about earlier with my colleague from Derby, actually having to teach something really helped sharpen my practice. I didn't lose my practice, it helped me sharpen my practice through reflecting on what I do and trying to pull out that embodied knowledge. So quite the contrary, it'll be interesting to hear colleagues, your thoughts at the end. Actually, I found through reflection, through articulation of practice, I've been able to actually sharpen my practice in many ways. And the second to uh, uh, we've already spoken about it just now, this lightning bolt moment is the second uh, myth I think we should definitely bust. Um, this whole notion here um, that we, we stand in a thunderstorm and we late, wait for the lightning to strike. Um, but Anthony Brands and David Eagleman talk around this as being a fallacy, saying that creative ideas evolve from existing memories and impressions. They arise from the interweaving of billions of microscopic sparks in the vast darkness of the brain. That sounds just as esoteric, <laughs> maybe in some ways. But what they go on to talk about is this notion of the magic, not it's, it's not magic, but work, that we're not waiting for lightning to strike. We're constantly through reflection, trying to improve our practice. Let's try out this methodology. Let's try out this, this technique. What will happen if I apply X to Y and see what happens? So we're not just sitting there waiting for something to happen. We have to work at that practice um, and then we have to reflect on that, going back to some of those reflective cycles at the beginning to really bring that back into the next iteration of that moment. And Brandt and Eagleman really talk about bending, breaking and blending in, in creative practice. When we bend something, we take something already in existence and modify it. So an example as a theatre director might be that notion of I took a restoration comedy, The Country Wife, um, uh, 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 you know, set in um, the 1660s onwards, but I transposed that to city life of London, contemporary city life, because of the themes in the play. I bent something already in existence and I modified it. When we break something, we take something apart and reassemble it differently. And when we blend something, we take different, two different, very different things and bring them together. So we're not waiting sometimes for lightning bolt moments. We're absolutely reflecting on something. Why is something not working? What if I bring two ideas together? What if I take this methodology and this methodology and move my practice forward? So blending is a concept that happens all the time in rehearsal rooms. It's a recurring theme. And all of this links to um, Darren Henley's notion, who's the Chief Executive of Arts Council England, that without creativity, nothing new would happen. So we're always having to consciously create something by blending, breaking um, and so on. So what was my methodology through all of this? I took ethnography. I observed somebody else in their setting, a group of people in their setting, and I wrote about it through reflecting on their practice, through reflecting on what I was seeing. So here we go, uh, going back to here, Julie Jones and Sal Watt. It's the writing about a group of people, ethnography. And you can have autoethnography, writing about self and reflecting on self and being a reflexive uh, practitioner. So I used ethnography as my standpoint uh, rather than my own practice. And I'll come on to that. Uh, why in a, in, a, in in five minutes or so? Um, and this relates to wanting to build rehearsal studies. It's an emerging field. So Gay Macaulay in 2012 in my field said that she reflected on this and said it's not a surprising fact that notwithstanding a century or so of scholarly concern with theatrical performance, relatively little has been written about the rehearsal practices from which these performances emerge. And we need to search, therefore, 
in my field, in rehearsal studies, I study rehearsals, either my own practice or other people's practice, we need to search for a methodology. The field needs its own methodology. So that's really important that I want to point out. So I am analytically describing other groups at work in ethnography. So I'm observing actors and directors in their field, and it's a framework for me to understand how rehearsal room discoveries come about. But I'm reflecting on what I have seen in the moment. I'm reflecting on, uh, uh, on all of that I'm seeing, the nonverbal communication as well as the verbal communication. I'm listening to subtext and tone as well, and I'm trying to make sense of that through my own reflections. And uh, it's talked about that the ethnographer has to find a fresh and different way into the research. You've got to think about things differently. And it shouldn't be just descriptive. We have to interpret. We have to seek to understand through our reflection. Now, what's really interesting here is that um, is I had to find a fresh lens. So I had to put myself in a position to bring new data. I couldn't necessarily go through any preconceived ideas. I'm a researcher here. I'm not a theatre director in that way. Although I have to acknowledge my professional position, I have to acknowledge the shoulders I stand upon. I have to also look at it through a fresh lens and try not to build, build preconceptions into that. And I want to just, um, I had a real moment. I went home one day and I, I, I was reflecting. I was reflecting in the action and then I reflected on the action. Something really tricky happened and this is from my field notes. So I was observing rehearsals. A quote uh, from my field notes here. A tricky situation occurred as Wasserberg, and uh, you may remember she's the theatre director here, kindly said to me to join them at the table, not to be on the outside of the action and to quote, contribute if you wish. I took the if you wish part literally. I didn't input, I could have, but to do so would have made me an actor in the piece rather than an observer gathering data. This moment really unsettled me because I really wanted to input. My directorial instinct kicked in. I wanted to give some notes. She wanted me to do that. She knew I was a theatre director, but I had to resist. It was not my place, not my place to do so. And Sigmund Freud's notion of the uncanny came out later. I was trying to reflect on that moment and I realised when um, a couple of days later, this is what Freud talks about the uncanny. I went back to some kind of, had to go back, I mentioned to a colleague of mine, what's this about? She said, it's about the uncanny and I remembered from my undergraduate here. This relates to a strangeness I was feeling in the moment, whereby something very familiar and homely becomes a ghostly opposite. Something familiar and homely becomes a ghostly opposite, where quote from Freud, one does not know where one is. And in that moment, I didn't know what I was. And I had to, I resisted, but it, it was a real struggle. In that moment, am I a director, am I a researcher? It wasn't later until I reflected on it, understood what was happening in that moment. I then sent the director, Kate Wasserberg, an email and said, thank you kindly earlier for asking me, to, and I won't be able to do that. So I was setting up my expectations as a researcher to make sure that that didn't happen again and it was all fine. She never asked me to sit at the table or, or get involved in that way again. So I didn't know where to place myself. Um, but objectivity, grounded theory, um, there's an exponent called Kathy Sharmas, and she talks about that as a researcher, sometimes our own perspective does have to be taken into account. We have to really acknowledge that and, re uh, and reflect on that uh, through our practice, because no study is, quote, what Sharmas says, totally objective. If I am, researching and reflecting on my own practice or reflecting on other people's practice and it's in my field how can that be totally objective Kathy Sharmas talks about that so we have to be really clear we have to we have to go to this notion of the blank slate that Sharmas talks about but I appreciate that that's a difficult slate to make blank in the first place in the last um 10 minutes here um, uh, um and then we'll open it up for discussion um in in practice as research, either with our own practice or, or working at other practice, there's a constant question about how do we verify that of quite a subjective felt experience. So in my case here, I was observing somebody else's rehearsal room and I felt that they'd had a breakthrough moment. So validity was really important by triangulating different things. So two actors. Um, Catherine O'Reilly and Sophie Melville, as well as the director, allowed me access to their scripts. 
Um, so I could see when, uh, and it's tiny here, there's a couple of pages here of, um, of Catherine O'Reilly's scripts, and I was trying to look at their notes and drawings and scribblings to give further clues to possible important moments that I thought, upon, in, my, in my reflective moment to try and reach an understanding, I thought actually that was important. I went back to the script. So if there were loads of notes around a section, loads of moments saying, ah, yeah, great. I've learned about this. Yes, do this. Stars underlining. They were visual clues that something important was happening for that actor in that moment. And you can see how busy these scripts are. I really had to go through that. And the second thing that I was able to do was interview all the actors and the director three weeks later. I gave them some questions to reflect upon their own practice. I asked them to reflect on their moments. And I actually, from my field notes, gave them different sections of breakthroughs. And I said, I thought these moments were really important to you. Upon reflection, were they important to you? Were they breakthrough moments for you? So it moves away, and this is in ethnography quite a lot, or to what I think is happening versus what is actually potentially happening. So what I thought was happening was a breakthrough. 90% of them, they were. I triangulated the data, I verified that through the discussions, and yes, absolutely they were. But there were a couple of moments where they said, no, that wasn't important for me. No, I have no memory of that moment whatsoever. Uh, and um, that fed into my, my research. So, and uh, Stephen uh, Lubet um, in 2018 was really looking at the dangers of ethnography, about not being able to verify uh, a felt experience or reflecting on other people's practice and to reach that understanding. It leaves researchers open to potential criticism and potentially, he argues, academic misconduct. So he has three very simple recommendations. One, accuracy. He says that we need to make sure um, that um, we have only things that we have observed or recorded. So you can't take, oh, this happened in rehearsal that I wasn't at, for example. This happened in rehearsal and I wouldn't be able to jot that down because I wasn't watching that. So that's really important. So I can't reveal moments that weren't outside of that and one hearsay. Um, another recommendation is around that notion of candor. There's clear distinction between direct observations and other sources. So, for example, here, I had to say in my research what was a direct observation and what was coming out of, say, the scripts or the interviews with the actors. I couldn't blur those. I had to be really clear about what I was drawing on. And then thirdly, he recommends um, making sure you document everything. So Stephen Lubeck talks around dates and nature of the communication, dates and locations are stated accurately because later cross checks can be made. Uh, I'm documenting everything as you saw in those earlier slides uh, from my field jottings. They have the time, the date, the notes and other details. Now, these can all be checked because all of those rehearsals are documented by the deputy stage manager in my field. So they could go back to the rehearsal notes from, from the deputy stage managers. And, and if someone wants to question my research, they can go back to those archived um, sources. So. Drawing all of this together, really, some people said, well, you're a theatre director, Rob. why don't you do autoethnography? Why don't you reflect on your own practice? Um, and J.A. Wilson talks about this, um, that, uh, that here that, quote, one of the primary methodological problems for artist scholars working in practices research is that they must wear at least two hats at all times. The researcher needs to get something out of the research, some output, while also wearing the artistic hat that that demands full presence in the artistic process. You've got two outputs. You've got the, your output that you might want to put in for ref or scholarly journal. And yet you've got to, I've got to get my show on on that Friday night at 7.30. That's not going away. It demands my full presence. The difficulty with using autoethnography for my research is that I wanted to look at the um, the nonverbal communication, the physical body language of the people in the room, that grin and that I wouldn't, I wanted to observe that in the moment, so I need to be on the outside in order to reflect on that practice. So I didn't, I did do some research a few years before this uh, reflecting in action uh, that led into this major piece of research, but it didn't quite do it for me. I needed to be on the outside. I was trying to reflect in action, but it wasn't working for me. So I'm trying to reflect in the moment. So for this particular piece of re research, the melody the methodology has to, of course, 
uh, fit what you need it to find out. So I needed to observe from the outside, look at the director actor relationship. I'm a theatre director. I needed to someone see someone else directing. So I used ethnography. I needed to view another company, another tribe, uh, going back to the original um, etymological roots there. Um, and this let all of this work led me absolutely to, and it's all in chapter five, absolutely led to my own practice, going right back to the beginning. I reflected on my own practice and it helped strengthen it. A big piece of understanding that I arrived at through reflecting on other people's practice and then reflecting on my own practice um, uh, was uh, Csikszentmihalyi's notion of flow, which some of you may have come across. Um, and this kind of draws us to a bit of a conclusion here. And it's it's in the it's in the book, shameless plug, um, how I've used this in, in a lot of detail. But on the axis on the left, there are challenges. Uh, on, on, on the uh, the vertical axis there, skills on the horizontal. Some people have used this before. If your challenge is is really high and the skills are really low, then you get completely anxious. So if I plunge my actors into something that's really challenging on day one, or I plunge my students into something that's really challenging on day one, without the relevant skills to get there, I've got high notions of anxiety. However, what I was observing in the rehearsal process that I was in, if there's repetition going on, so the skills were increased and increased and increased, but then there were no new challenges, as it were, their skills had reached a point. And there were no new challenges, either from the actor bringing their own challenge or the director. The actor starts to get bored. They weren't in what Ching Ch Ch Mihai talks about this notion of flow where the challenge and the skill aligns and you're in op that notion of optimal experience. Slow's written about, and I encourage people to look at this notion of flow, really help. I had to reflect on what, what framework could I use to try and understand why some actors are getting really anxious in some rehearsals and why there are some moments of boredom. And it's to do with meeting challenge and skill head on. It took quite a moment, uh, quite a lot of reflection on this to work out what was going on. Um, and Mark Silberschatz talks around this. He says that the rehearsal journey is one where challenges continually increase in sympathy with the actor's skills. This approach, in his research, led to a significantly flow conducive process. So I was reflecting on my own practice over 20 years as a theatre director. I was reflecting on the close quarters observation that I'd done and making sense of all of this. And this finally led, which is which again is in the book, bringing all of this together, it finally led to a methodology that I brought forward, which is around the four lenses of breakthrough. This arrived at following much reflection on my own practice and other people's practice. What kind of types of breakthrough you have in rehearsal and what they are, leading from small moments of recognition to quite bigger moments of aha moments of discovery of something new to moments of huge wow moments where everything coalesces and comes together. But all leading to that model of working was probably reflecting on what well, I started in 1999, my first paid gig as a theatre director, my proper paid gig, probably reflecting on all that time leading up to about 2020 through my practice, through my teaching, through making the implicit and embodied explicit, through this observational work, through doing some ethnographic practice, through using these reflective models to eventually come to an understanding of how we make breakthroughs as creative practitioners in rehearsal. That's a, two decades really of ongoing iterative reflective practice in different in different parts. And going right back to the beginning around those reflective models um, uh, around the um, this whole notion. So going back to Colt's notion of the, the what next. So I've had done my conceptualization. I am trying this out now through my professional practice as, as active experimentation. I'm now putting this into practice when I go back and direct in a rehearsal room and putting that back into my practice to lead to another experience, which I'm sure will lead me down another path completely. But, but that's fine. Life's for exploring and things change and our reflections take us to to new and exciting places. So. Um, 
I know I've packed quite a bit in there and I hope it's made some kind of sense. So I'm going to stop sharing um, my screen somehow and, and hand back to Agatha. I think. Thank you. Thank you. Rob, that was really, I saw, that was really fast. So I had a long list of questions before you started the presentation, but uh, my piece is much longer and it's also scribbled in a very creative way. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm happy I can relate to your um, scribbles there over there. So um, I think there's lots of things we can unpack following your, your, your fascinating talk here, but um, perhaps the first important thing we should establish is um, the idea that the reflection is a form of evaluation for what we do, both as practitioners uh, and as researchers. This is what helps us evaluate whether we're on the right track with whatever aims and goals we have for our research and practice or practice-based research altogether. And it was really fascinating for me to hear about your really elaborate way to uh, engage with this reflective practice and obviously uh, doing ethnography and, and, and analyzing your data and effectively writing a really fascinating book. Shameless <laughs> plug. <laughs> with all the ideas, that's obviously one way of, of, of dealing with this. It was really nice uh, to kind of bring it to jo uh, Justin's comment, who said, well, not until um, she started teaching, because obviously writing about your um, your your um, reflect reflective practice is one way. Teaching, so verbalizing what you what you what your what your reflections are about is another way. And then Francisco added, well, actually, when you do your PhD, that's part of your of your job as well as practice based research. So you have to do your uh, theoretical grounding, you have to engage with your practice, and then you have to reflect on is this golden triangle we all know about. But what, what I was wondering is, how do we practice reflective practice on daily basis? Because all these three things we discussed are um, big projects in itself. And I was really, really fascinated to hear about how we sat for five weeks at the rehearsal room and, 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 and engage with all this analysis. But could you perhaps talk a little bit about how you implement your creative practice on a daily basis within your practice as a practitioner and researcher on a smaller scale? Uh, is there anything which works for you on, on, on this kind of smaller scale without necessarily turning in, this into a book every time? I think um, I'll answer it through a few lenses, if that's all right, as a practitioner and as an, potentially as an educator. Um, as, as an educator, I think um, I've been really aware, um, particularly in higher education at the moment, particularly um, with the um, demands on uh, the set, sorry, the, 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 the challenges on the sector with the creative arts and so on, is that it's really incumbent on us as educators to embed reflective practice in what the students are doing. So I think I think it becomes then a matter of course if we build that in from our first year student experience, because what will often happen when I when I work with undergraduate students at level four, so concentrating on the educational side for a minute, they'll 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 have done they'll say oh we've done loads of reflective journals at BTEC and A level. When you look at them, they're actually just describing what happened. It's not a reflection on the process and it's not an analysis. It's not drawing together any maybe wider reading or conceptual um, wider reading to, to support and frame their, their practice in the studio. So a big job I think is incumbent on us is to create reflective practitioners, the practitioner researcher that Nelson talks about in practices research. I think we need to build that culture in our, this is my personal feeling as the head of department, build that culture in our degree schemes for when 18 year old comes in. So that why go to higher education, whether it's an undergrad, postgrad or, or, or a doctoral researcher, why do that in a higher educational environment? Because you are doing concrete reflective practice using maybe in level four, some of these very concrete, level five, very concrete um, uh, um, uh, models. I think they're tangible, they're really strong as a way in, that then becomes part and parcel of their embodied practice. So that when they are, so that's, so yes, you're starting from a vague place of, 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 of conscious, um, uh, ways in to that. I think that's really important uh, for, for me. So that's me banging my drum a little bit in relationship to 
what I think what we should be offering our students in higher education when they come and study the creative arts. They can still come and learn to be a filmmaker, but actually they become to become a reflective, uh, critical, creative um, filmmaker or practitioner or theatre maker and so on. So I think I think that's how we do it with others. <laughs> I think I think if we're in this arts based practice community, how do we share that? And bring that bring that forward. Um, just to talk about reflection and transition. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we'll pick up on that in a minute. And then, but in part of my own practice, I, I didn't realise I I wasn't doing that very well in the first decade of my professional life. It was through having a really tricky moment in a rehearsal room, reflecting on that deeply, then starting to build that in. So in my practice, it's very simply at the end of a working day with rehearsals. Let's say I'm working on a musical or a pantomime, which is my, I can only talk about my field. I can't, I can't adapt this to anyone else's field necessarily. We'll have a reflective debrief at the end of the moments. What are we going to do tomorrow? I know we said we'd do this in rehearsal tomorrow, but actually that actor's really struggling. So can I work with that actor, please? Can we adapt the schedule that we put into place two weeks ago in order to make sense, but through a reflective process, having that downtime, a little bit of incubation, let's have a break, can we come back together for 10 minutes? Is what we said we'd do tomorrow still the right thing to do tomorrow? So in theatre, building that, consciously building that in, building a culture of reflective practice in the rehearsal room and so on and so forth, that's, that's really important. Um, often asking, um, so for example, I've changed my practice and again, it's in, in chapter five, um, it might not be in chapter five, sorry, but when we've done a run through, which is in chapter five, when we've done a run through, I will ask actors to reflect on their own practice first now. When I first started as a theatre director, well, you did a run through, I sit there at the front and have all my notes and I get everyone to sit down and I reel through my notes. And I just talk at them for half an hour. I look back and I shudder at that little old 20 year old me lecturing uh, really experienced actors in the room, giving my notes, my pearls of wisdom. But what I ask the actors to do, I try and um, uh, inculcate that in the rehearsal room. So actually I ask the actors to reflect now on that run through. What worked, what didn't work, what was working for you, what do you want to do next? They'll do some self-noting. We'll talk about their process first, so they're becoming reflective actors, professional actors in that space. And then often my notes are crossed off half of them because they've already understood them. So I'm also as a practitioner in my trying to do my own reflection at the end of day to day, but encouraging reflective practice. And it's something that I talk about in the book, my job as a theatre director, and it's also our job as educators as well, that they need to fly, You go, I go on opening night, they need to own that piece of work. Our students will graduate, they need to fly without us. How do I build in that sense of ownership from day one? It's making sure that the actors can do that reflection on their own. They don't need me to come back, shouldn't. If I've got that culture right, they shouldn't need me to come back after four weeks and note that show again. They shouldn't be, uh, they shouldn't be treated in that parent-child relationship. I might come back and note it, it's in my contract to note it, but hopefully they've been reflective practitioners and then making those judgments in action and on action as a result of bringing that culture into the rehearsal room. So that's how I've adapted it in my own practice over the years, getting my actors to be reflective all the way through so that they can make those adaptations themselves. They're not in a parent-child relationship with the director, that they have, they are, they are creative artists. I am an outside eye. We've got different roles. It's not, it's it's got a hierarchical uh, structure in the rehearsal room, director, actor, but it should be like that. I'm a leader, it's my job amongst equals, and I have to make sure that they can completely own that project by opening night. So so yes, so that's that's how I do it as potentially an educator. Uh, very similar, actually. I've just just reflected on that moment because <laughs> because I've actually said the same things. I'm trying to build that culture of reflective practice through all the work that I do. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a fantastic answer, and and it, I know we have some really nice comments in the chat, which I will get to in a second. But I, I kind of wanted to continue, if that's okay, because it really leads me very nicely to my next questions. I mean, it's it's 
difficult for me to ask, especially because you talked about it so much already, but I think it's so important in, in many types of creative practice. And I was particularly interested uh, to hear your point of view as a theatre director, and you did mention that a moment ago as well. But I was wondering if you feel that there is a difference between individual reflective practice between yourself and your actors, or is there such a thing as a collective creative practice, which is not a summary of individual creative, uh, sorry, reflective practices, or but rather a, a collective one? I don't know if that question makes sense, but I was just wondering if, if in the way you approach it, because obviously that's really important how your reflective practice meets other people's reflective practice and I, I know you explained that that is being um, achieved through dialogue and through discussion but I was wondering if these two things are two different entities and they're just or is it just a collection of individual reflective practices communicated between individuals I, I don't know if this question makes sense I'm going to answer what I think the question is and you must tell me if I'm not answering your question <laughs> is that okay I'm sorry if I, I got this wrong. Um, I was really keen on this notion of the wow moment where the whole room came together and it all felt what Kate Ross Manneth talks about and Arya Manushkin talks about the, the uh, uh, theatre director, European theatre director, this moment of rightness, collective rightness. And what's quite interesting, there was a moment of wow where all of those little individual moments of discovery and collective reflections and all of that all came together in a run through that really worked. And I was observing this and, and they finished the run through and they all kind of collapsed. And they were, wow, and all this kind of stuff was happening and they were looking to each other and there's a, there was there were eye contact, there was, a, there was smiles and they and I and in that moment, it's probably not answering your question, but in that moment, there was a collective reflection. It wasn't articulated as that. There was a collective reflection in that in that moment, which they went, that worked. There was a rightness. And it was interesting, the notes that were given afterwards, and they were led by the assistant director, not the director, were all about capturing the spirit of what they discovered together. Let's reflect on what just happened collectively. And how do we capture, not repeat, George Bernard Shaw, never just repeat, you, otherwise your school teaching as a director. How do we capture the spirit of that practice now every single time? Because that's what the audience have paid. If we've experienced that in this, it was right at the end, it was a technical rehearsal, light, sound, set, all coming together. Sorry, just rehearsal, light, sound, set, all coming together. It worked together. It was a collective moment of reflection from a collective rightness, which came out of four weeks of little moments of reflection, little moments of rightness all coming together. I don't know if that's answered your question. Oh, exactly, that's exactly what I was, uh, what I was uh, kind of thinking. So, so thank you so much for confirming that. That's what I imagined when we were talking about this story, and I was just, you know, trying to see if I understood this idea uh, in, in a way I, I should have. That's that's wonderful. So I have so many questions I want to ask you, but I do think I have to look at uh, what is in the chat. So first of all, uh, Jocelyn uh, says I think the students would be combining reflection and transition, and um, I think we all can agree. Uh, anyone who uh, is um, in higher education on the kind of teaching side here that. As we rightly said, we do embed it in, in what students do. And I think it was quite nice for me right now uh, working with level six students and asking them to reflect on the last three years. And they, many of them didn't realize how much they've learned over the last three years. It was just this moment of reflection. It's like, oh, really, I, I am a very different person uh, <laughs> uh, compared to what I was uh, or who, uh, who I was three years ago. So I think it's, um, it's probably what we're talking about. Giselle, a question, please. I'm embarking on it, Otno. Uh, not not oh, not biographical research. I'm so sorry. As a small scale experimental physics theater, physical theater maker, often solo work involving in sorry inter physical and aerial solo work. Uh, Are we the interception okay. in physical aerial work? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Any advice for me? It's getting the methodology right and capturing the data that you need. Um, so a lot of autoethnography um, often might have, particularly if you're um, a solo artist, a lot of people use video so that they can just be the artist in that whole day, if you're in a studio, and then watch their work back. So again, 
combining it, it's just the ethnography part of it. And then you're distancing yourself, you're looking at it through the lens of the researcher. Um, for me, I didn't video as an ethnographer at the rehearsal room. It's too obtrusive. They were moving rehearsal rooms, the setup, the down, the on and the off. But I was in consultation. I looked at the ins and outs of all of using video and so on, but in the end used a, a really unob unobtrusive um, uh, old fashioned dictaphone <laughs> in that way. But I think if you're a solo artist, then you've got a really strong opportunity to use video. And also if you're collaborating with other people, you can ask them to do all those ethical release forms. Can I video? It's just for the purposes of my own research and uh, and so on and so forth, that you can then look in on yourself and you can listen back to the conversations that you've had. It tries to counter the problem that we looked at in one of the slides, that whole notion of I'm the practitioner, I've got a job to do, I've got a, an audience to meet with my work, and yet I'm also trying to research this. So how do I collect data? You might also have your own working notebook as well. So you might on those downtimes do your reflection on your practice. But I would argue for your own health, health and well-being to factor all of that into your working day. Let's say your working day is, is 10 till 6. Actually, your creative practice may only be four hours because you might want to build in an hour, uh, an hour and a quarter for lunch. And a quarter of an hour of that is 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 reflecting on your morning's work. You might want to finish at four or three, so you've got a couple of hours to then review some of the videos uh, of those moments so that you're not, because it's really easy with auto, it's very different, sometimes so, it's, it's easy with auto ethnography to end up just your whole evening is replaying stuff, reflecting, watching videos, listening. Actually, we have lives, we have families, we have work to do. So how do I, how do I, if this is going to be uh, um, an autoethnographic -ethnogra piece of work that's going to have a research output and a creative output, how do I factor that into my working day or my time? And I think that for me is key because I do know a lot of people who reflect on their own practice and then they're up all night transcribing because you can't wait necessarily until um, your practice is over. What did I do in week one? It's just, it's it, you need to be capturing along the way. So I'd argue that just on pure pragmatics and for your own well-being, factoring that into your schedule as both the practitioner and as the researcher. Um, but I'm more than happy to pick stuff up um, outside of this session if there's more more things we could talk about. But I, I'd start off on a practical level um, for, for, for well-being, really. I think it's really important. And I, there's another book I, I would like to kind of, uh, bring to people's attention. That's about um, how to make the most of your research journal. And, um, Nicole was uh, taking part in this in this seminar series and she was talking about uh, this idea as well. Well, in, in, in different contexts slightly, but I, I think it's really important what you said about so scheduling and making sure scheduling time and making sure you actually embed it in your daily rhythm is really important because I I know talking to, to many um, creative practitioners. Because of what we do, it's very chaotic and you touch upon it in a very nice way. Uh, today we talked about this idea of worrying two hearts and how it's sometimes conflicting. So again, we have this reflection in action where we have to take a decision in the moment and that links very nicely to Colin's comment about uh, being self-aware and adaptable, adapt adaptable to change. But then um, this idea of uh, uh, reflection uh, on action and, and just looking back at things and that obviously requires time. And I know that many um, practitioners uh, end up having long journals, but they never really have time to look back at them until they make it into a separate project. So I think it's really important and I would definitely second what you said in terms of making sure this is part of your, again, um, weekly or daily or monthly has to be written. And, and I'll tell you what, another forward thinking piece of work, if you're starting off on an autoethnographic or ethnographic approach or reflective approach, practices research, is not to be it's really easy to be overwhelmed. You're halfway through your projects and you've got a mass of data and you, you look at that pile of notes, and journals and recordings. And you think, gosh, I've got I've got 17 hours worth of video material. It's really easy to suddenly become overwhelmed yeah. with that. And you think, actually, I've still got my piece of work to do. So just just I'm always I'm saying there will be be ex have an expectation that there will be a moment of uh, you will be overwhelmed, but and then try and get rid of that because we've all gone through that. Try and put that to one side. Continue with your professional practice. Get that piece of work open to a public 
then start to, as John Britton talks, that slide I put up from John Britton right at the beginning, then begin to analyse, reflect and understand. Actually, sometimes you might need to just prioritise the doing. You've got all this data, you've done a bit of analysis along the way, but you, there will be an overwhelming, potential overwhelming moment. Um, I was actually for this, in preparation for this seminar, I went back and I thought, gosh, the, 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 the notes that I have were that thick from those five weeks. I filled in so much. Um, and I do remember when I was looking back on it, having that overwhelming moment. That's why it's really important to try and code along the way. We haven't got time to talk about all the different methodologies today, but grounded theory talks about trying to code, find codes, and you could do that along the way. Um, uh, so that when you're looking back, you're going straight to things, or I was starring things that I knew I wanted to transcribe. So I knew I didn't have to transcribe the whole day, just going to transcribe that moment because it was important. There was a rightness, Kate Moss Marin says, as the researcher, trust the rightness, trust the felt experience of the rightness, that that's a moment I need to look back on in that moment. Mm. I think it's also very important in relation to this idea, and again, you talked about it in, in a really nice way today, this idea of implicit versus explicit perfection. And then again, we can go back to Sean and we can again look at, uh, again, uh, Linda Candy's book, uh, we can look at all that in there. And I think it also links to, I kind of wanted to touch upon what Colin says once again, um, this idea of having having the capacity to stop and pause sometimes, and you do talk about this moment where you have to stop for a moment before you uh, engage in a reflection and decide what's right or what's wrong. Uh, and this implicit reflection has to perhaps materialize itself and, and, and become embedded into your actions as well. Uh, so this capacity to sometimes just make sure that we stay on track with what we do being creative, artistic or educational uh, work. So sometimes it's really easy to get sidetracked with so many things going on around and especially with a creative type of research, things just changing in a very organic way. And it's sometimes really, really necessary to stop and just make sure to reevaluate your goals and aims to make sure you're heading the direction you're heading. Would you agree? I, and that's really important, I think, to that because we're in, so for example, going back to the, looking at through an educator's lens, we're in education. I'm not putting on a theatre show with my students to be um, to be reviewed by Michael Billington in The Guardian and I have to make a huge piece of work. The show is a byproduct, in a way, of the learning that happens through that process. Of course we want to make a, to use a judgmental phrase, a, a strong or good piece of theatre, of course, and students will get that self-worth, but actually I would prefer to cut down a Shakespeare play to an hour and a half and have space in that learning time of those five weeks rehearsal because I'm, there should be learning through that. Space for reflection, space for understanding, space for triangulation, questioning, because actually the piece of theatre will be, their, their practice will be stronger as a result. So if they did go into the profession and then had to do a full length piece of Shakespeare, they've come at it as a place of informed, inquiring, reflective practitioners. So I think it's really, again, going back to the educator lens, is you can put on 50, I could just do a degree scheme tomorrow and just do show after show after show and loads of students will probably come because it feels nice. No, go and join the Amateur Dramatic Society and do that. We, we, we've got a role to structure this, what, what your whole seminar series has been doing, got to find a way softly, potentially, in tiny ways at undergrad, much more embedded then as we move through and into level six, seven and eight. We've got to do that as educators. I, that's that's why I, my personal feeling uh, with my head of department hat on. No, no, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I'm sure anyone who is here in the audience right now um, would definitely agree with you. I think I think it's just this basically helps us refocus and make sure we kind of to use this language hitting our targets in terms of what we're doing. But again, I just wanted to once again reinforce this, the, the, the idea even between your creative practice and research. I, I remember that I can definitely relate to that. I remember when I was uh, working in Colombia and um, filming with um, the Arwako community, I just really wanted to roam around and just take beautiful photographs. That's all I wanted to do. And I realized, well, I cannot do it because I'm here for a reason and there's some things I need to achieve from this. So I just needed sometimes to, to really, really put myself in the right place through reflective, through reflections as well. This is the reason why I'm here. Perhaps I can come another time and take nice photos, but right now I'm here to do the job and this is what my priority is. So I think it was just, Absolutely. yeah. It's really, really, really important. Yeah, and, and 
being explicit around that, being being the reflective practitioner enough to be able to know that that's what you need to do in that moment. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. I, th I think again, this is this is another uh, topic which again, if we had more time, we could unpack. So, I'm just going to read the last comment, and I think it's time for us to slowly wrap it up. Sadly, um, so Giselle says this was very helpful. Um, I feel so good to go to overwhelm, definitely. As you say, video, etc., quickly accumulates and uh, can take the same time uh, all over again to review. Um, so big consideration. Thank you. So yeah, I, I definitely. Yeah, just when you're looking back, you may only be looking at five to ten minutes. Otherwise, you'd have a day in rehearsal and then another day of looking at all the video and doing that again. Definitely. So I very much hope that this kind of uh, activity, like like the like seminar, is also an opportunity for us to reflect on what we do. And, and I think that's what I was hinting uh, to be forwarded through having conversations and speaking to like minded people who, who engage with creative practice. It, it is a very, very good form of uh, reflective practice. Uh, would, would you agree? Absolutely. And, and just on a practical point, can I send you my slides to, yes. to uh, distribute? Absolutely, absolutely. So I was about to, to, to ask about that as well. Um, thank you so much, Rob. It was absolutely wonderful to have you here today. And once again, thank you because I know how busy you are. I really uh, I really feel sorry when, when I see you just running from one meeting to another. So, so I appreciate it even more. That just really means a lot. And um, I think we had a really fantastic discussion here. Again, uh, if we had another two hours, I'm sure this could continue. But I'm sure there's going to be more opportunities to, to um, explore this topic more on different levels. Um, what I just wanted to, to do very quickly before we wrap it up, just, I just wanted to say to people that um, I will be in touch about our next session. It's it's scheduled for the 15th of June, but I cannot make it because I have a hospital appointment and I'm a one month band here, so I might have to reschedule or do something else. Um, the good news is that this last session, what was supposed to be the last session, uh, uh, which was meant to be on um, designing effective training, is not really um, the last session anymore. So there's uh, there's going to be uh, round two starting in a new academic year because there's lots of people getting in touch and it looks like there's a lot of need for this kind of seminar. So this is not the end. Um, what I'll do, I will probably create a round table meeting for everyone to have it more as a discussion about what the most effective form of training and support for practice based researchers is rather than me trying to come up with uh, with ideas which are there. I think we should collectively discuss this, but I'll be in touch with everyone and I will communicate all of that through the regular channels. So once again, thank you so much, everyone. I'll do my best to have to make sure that this um, recording is out online later today, if not uh, well, tomorrow, if not later today. So once again, thank you. Thank you, Rob. And I wish everyone a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you for inviting me.